Hey, aloha everybody. Welcome to weekly live Q&A. If you are here for the very first time, then welcome. I'm so excited you're here. This is a community for adult survivors of complex trauma, any type of childhood trauma, any type of trauma that has been concurrent over a long period of time. So if you're an adult who survived any type of ongoing childhood abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, cult abuse, religious abuse, um, if you are an adult who was in an adult relationship that was toxic or abusive in any way, and that happened over a long period of time, you could be living with the after effects of complex trauma. And this community, um, I've been coming here every week for about three years or more than three years now and we have a community that's been growing and growing um, now the um, we're up to over 3,000 of you in over 180 countries and um, some of you are here live in the chat box talking back and forth with one another some of you are over on Twitter and you're using the hashtag no more shame if you would be so kind as to send your questions in I will do my very best to answer them during tonight's live Q&A the topic tonight is part two of a series we're doing on complex PTSD core belief restructuring and behavior change uh, this is as a result of your guys's texts and tweets and DMs and messages and voice memos, posts in our private groups, private emails you send me, and it's as a result of my own work that I've been doing on my own trauma over the past 17 years, but more specifically over the past um, eight weeks or so, um, maybe even 12 weeks. <laughs> um, I've been doing another wave of EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing, and we'll be talking about a multi-pronged approach which will help us to feel better considering the fact that our abuse or our trauma came from multiple different areas um, or multiple facets of our life. So complex trauma does tend to require a more complex approach for healing, a multi-pronged healing approach. And I believe that that is what helps us the most. Uh, we've been talking about these sorts of topics here on this channel for the better part of three years. We started off here at this channel. Um, we have a Roku TV channel and we have this YouTube channel. And we talked for years specifically to adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse until I started receiving multiple emails and posts and memos and voice messages and so forth and even written correspondence in the mail at my PO box saying well Athena my, my trauma wasn't sexual in nature but all the other things that you're mentioning match up to what my life is feels like right now so is what you're talking about on your channel I'm not an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse Athena but everything you're saying relates to me so I hope I'm still welcome here and so as soon as I started receiving enough of those messages I've shifted the verbiage here on our site and I want this to be an inclusive environment for any adult who is experiencing the after effects of complex trauma so you are welcome here you belong here really quickly I want you to know if you don't belong here and if this isn't for you. If you're a cyber bully, if you have nothing better to do with your time than to pick on a girl who shows up here every week voluntarily to talk to trauma survivors, you're not welcome here. Uh, we won't tolerate any type of cyber bullying or um, spamming or just inappropriateness. You'll be deleted or put in timeout immediately. And I just want you to know that right off the bat. So, and your comments will be deleted if you leave them after the fact, if I believe that you are not being helpful or if you're being abusive towards anyone else. So, um, not, not sorry, <laughs> not even sorry, not sorry. I'm just not sorry. So you're welcome here. If you are an adult survivor of trauma and you want to receive 
community support and healing and you want to give community support and healing. Um, we do have um, over in the chat box on YouTube a list of all kinds of different hotline numbers. Over on Twitter right now, I believe if I'm not mistaken, there are many of you guys that are tweeting out hotline numbers for the Rape Abuse Incest National Network, RAINN.org, 1-800-656-HOPE. There is the Crisis Text Line, crisistextline.org. You can text the word START to 741741. There's the Suicide Prevention Hotline, one of our newest additions to um, the resources that we're tweeting out and that we're sharing. And you guys are copying those and keeping them on your clipboard so that you can share them with people. These videos are never, ever a replacement for mental health care, professional medical help. So please seek a licensed professional. Please seek a certified professional should you desire to work through any of your trauma. I'm not here to give you advice or diagnose you or help you personally. I'm here sharing from a lived experience perspective and to provide an open forum for survivors like you and like me to feel welcome and to feel supported and to feel safe. So if that's you, you're welcome. And if that's not you on the other end, then you're not welcome. So. Um, Tonight, again, we're going to be talking, it's, this is part two of a series on healing, complex PTSD, core belief restructuring, and behavior change. So really quick, um, Harriet, if you could pop up last week's video link, or if you wanted to go down below in the description section of this video, I believe there's a link to last week's video, and or it's right here on the channel where you're at. It's just last week, like six days ago. And that is part one of healing CPTSD, core belief restructuring, and behavior change. We talked a lot about some things that came up for me in EMDR, some core beliefs that I needed to work on and restructure, and some behaviors that I needed to change in order to feel better, because I'm living with the effects of CPTSD. And I have emotional flashback. I have dissociation. I have these things that show up every now and then. Sometimes I'll go weeks and weeks and weeks and I won't have anything happen. Other times it takes up the majority of my day and that's no fun. So I just want to be a source of support and encouragement for you guys and let you know that you're not alone and that I'm here to provide a safe space for you to come receive healing and to share healing and acceptance with other people. So really quickly, I just want to welcome anyone who is showing up here. Thanks for all of you guys that show up early every week and um, you're here to join the conversation and to support one another and I'm just super duper grateful for you guys. So um, last week, just so you guys know, there were a whole bunch of questions that I did answer and I want to really quickly um, just thank Monica, John, Hunter, Beach Boxer, Joey, Julie, Grace Hope, Jess, Declan, and Deborah. And then I also want to thank uh, Poppy and Heroes Don't Wear Capes, Joey, Roleplay Host, Sabra, Julie, Monica, Willow, Tara or Tara, <laughs> Gary, and Sharon. And also I want to thank Ashton and Monica and Rach and anyone else who's sending in their questions for tonight. So I'm gonna be answering as many questions as I possibly, possibly can. This seems to be kind of a hot topic for you guys, and so I want to um, just answer as many questions as I possibly can and make this a really informative hour for you. I have a screen share for you guys so that we can, um, so you all can understand the direction this conversation is going in, and, um, Perhaps I can tweet this out for you later or give you access to it later if that's something that you would like. So really quickly, um, I'm going to pull up a screen share for you guys. I want to say thanks for being here. And please send in your questions. I'll do my best to answer them. If we need to go to part three on this particular topic because it's something that you guys need and want, then I am more than happy to do part three. <laughs> uh, this is a topic that I'm really, really, really passionate about. And let's just see if I can uh, pull up a screen share for you guys. Here we go. How are you guys feeling? Oh, um, every week, let me get out of the screen so I can see you. 
every week, you guys ask me, what can I do to support the work you're doing, Athena? What can I do to support the work you're doing with survivors? First of all, I want to say thank you to a very, very, very generous financial donor that donated to this channel, uh, contacted me privately and asked me if they could um, dedicate their birthday to the work I'm doing with survivors. And they sent me a very generous monetary donation. Um, and I'm just humbled. And then um, two other people that live here on the island um, got wind of and know of the work that I'm doing here with you guys for the past few years. And they made an extremely generous financial donation. And so that's amazing. And I'm humbled and I'm grateful because um, it helps me to offset the cost of all the different software and and um, I have Harriet that helps me get everything ready for you guys. And I have um, software that delivers downloadable resources to you guys. I have hosting costs for websites and um, email capture software. I have all of it. So all the monetary donations are amazing. But I don't need your guys' money if you're here hanging out and you're a survivor. I just want to be here as a source of support for you. So there's no pressure to ever send me any money. You guys are here um, and your attention and your support of one another is enough. And the best thing you could possibly do as a survivor that's watching this channel right now is to give this video a thumbs up and to comment in the comment section once the video is done being live. And that shows YouTube and Roku and Google that I'm putting out content that is relevant for this community and it helps me a lot. So if you thumbs up this video, you subscribe to this channel and click the little bell so that you know when I'm going live. Lots of changes coming around the bend in 2018. Super, super, super exciting. And um, so thanks. Thanks for being here. And um, But I did want to say thank you to those three people. Um, you know who you are. I know that you're anonymous and that's totally fine and I'm just unbelievably humbled and grateful for all three of you. So I have a screen share for you guys. Let me know if you can see this. Give this video a thumbs up. Give yourselves a thumbs up. And uh, hopefully you can see this screen share. We're talking about healing complex PTSD, core belief restructuring, and behavior change. Um, so we talked a little bit last week about identifying our past abuse. We actually have talked on several different videos about identifying our past abuse and the, tra the trauma that we incurred. And we need to actually choose to accept the reality of it all because we could choose to deny it if we wanted to and just stay in relationship with toxic people and allow ourselves to continue to repeat those patterns. Um, I also want to preface this conversation with, you know, this this nice little neat bullet list that I'm giving you on this screen share. It's, it's not that easy. None of this is a one and done. None of it is a bullet point. I've simply laid these things out in bullets so that we could um, succinctly consume this information. But I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, insinuating that the healing from the level of trauma that you all have endured from childhood for decades and decades and decades can just be fixed in a snap with some bullet points. I want to be really, 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 really clear about that. This is simply a list that is easily printable. I can make it into a little printable thing that I, we can tweet out. Super easy. You can put it up anywhere you need to put it up. I'm happy to share this with everybody. These are just good reminders. And if we're doing any one of these lists on this bullet point list, then it's going to help us move in the direction of feeling better and not experiencing our emotional flashbacks to the degree that we're experiencing them now. So um, I just wanted to be really clear that none of us is one bullet point away from just healing and fixing our entire life and everything's just going to be perfect from here on out. That's just not a realistic idea or goal or approach. 
So this bulleted list is simply my way of simplifying something that is extremely complex for you, my family of survivors that I am here to serve um, because I want to be here. So really quickly, bullet point number one, we're going to identify past abuse and complex trauma. We are going to choose to accept the reality of all of our abuse and our trauma. And we are going to intentionally choose to reframe the core beliefs that are holding us back. We'll talk more about that as I answer your guys' questions. Bullet point number two, we must all choose to look at our past trauma with fresh eyes. Refusing to numb stuff and avoid our pain through maladaptive coping strategies. We talked a lot about maladaptive coping strategies here on this channel. They would be um, such as um, drinking in excess, recreational drug use, numbing, stuffing, and avoiding through busyness, social media addiction, gambling addiction, shopping addiction, pornography, um, anything that numbs you from reality, anything that enables you to stuff your feelings and move on as though they don't exist, anything that helps you to avoid your pain and avoid your feelings uh, just by moving on to something else, just bypassing everything. That never helps us heal. Bullet point number three, always remember that you are a whole person. You are not a list of symptoms, and therefore we need to take a holistic approach if we are going to ever heal fully and enjoy our life. And um, as much as it is very tempting for us to look up lists of symptoms and we know that we tick off all the boxes and so we follow the little bullet point and we think we're going to be all healed, and that's not the case with complex trauma, you guys. It just isn't. Next bullet point, always make it your goal to clearly address any and all chemical imbalances created by alcohol, drugs, and eating disorders. You guys, this is key. You cannot and will not heal if you are using alcohol in excess, using drugs, and if you are currently living with an eating disorder. Those are all symptoms of a root trauma. This is not something that everybody wants to hear right now. I'm not saying that being here with us right now is not a step in the right direction. I want to congratulate you for being here with us. I want to tell you how proud I am of you for being here with us. I want to tell you how much I respect you for being here with us. However, when we live with chemical imbalances like I have, this is not a me pointing the finger at you guys. I'm included in all of this. I have used alcohol in excess. I have experimented with recreational drugs and I have lived with eating, eating disorder. So I want you to know that we need to always make it our goal to clearly address those things because they will prohibit us from healing to the fullest degree that we are able to heal. They, it will keep us from living the life that we truly deserve. Next bullet point. We need to always choose to combine experiential learning with cognitive learning. So what is that and what do I mean and how? So in addition to the traditional talk therapies like um, CBT and um, safe place imagery and motivational interviewing and when you go to the therapist and you speak about your trauma, I need you to remember that when you intentionally choose to release your past trauma and your unresolved pain through some form of somatic or physical modality, then you are all the more likely to heal and live a life that you deserve to live. So these things that I'm gonna talk about right now are separate from talk therapy and they're not a replacement for talk therapy. I want to be really, really, really clear, okay? There are not a whole bunch of psychiatrists and psychologists and psychotherapists and licensed clinical social workers and CBT specialists and all of that out there just for, just for funsies. No, they're there because, because they are effective and they're amazing, especially if they're trauma-informed. So some examples of somatic and physical modalities are trauma-sensitive yoga, nutritional education, like learning how to prepare whole, organic, and delicious meals, detox, if necessary, from the above-mentioned alcohol and drugs, acupuncture, deep body work, such as massage, structural integration, cranial sacral, and gentle group 
exercise or fitness modalities. Um, there are usually low impact versions of different group classes where people exercise together or one of my favorites is when you get the DVD or you can watch it on YouTube for free and you follow what it is that they're doing. You know, you can pull something up on YouTube and then through this little Apple TV box or pull it up on a Roku, uh, Roku box watch free fitness videos and you can just go at your own pace and do low impact modalities for you even if you only have access to your arms even if you have only have access to your upper body I know there are many of the survivors here that are in our community that are in wheelchairs or that are physically limited due to chronic illness and autoimmune disease I want you to know that anything that's physical in nature like the ones that I have mentioned here, these are all going to help you when you use them in conjunction with, in tandem with talk therapy. So again, I want to note really clearly, somatic and physical healing modalities are not a replacement for traditional talk therapies. They work in tandem with one another. And just to wrap it all up, you guys, CPTSD and complex trauma calls for a more complex healing approach, a multi-pronged approach. I tweeted that out just before this broadcast. So I just want you guys to know that, um, you know, this is something that I'm devoting much of my life to. This is my life's work. This is something I'm very, very passionate about. I've done it wrong. I did it wrong for 10 or more years, maybe even 15 years. And just for the past few years, maybe between 10 and 15 years I probably I didn't do it wrong but I wasn't I wasn't going about I wasn't as serious about my overall healing as I could have been I was ill-informed I was not fully educated um, nor was I open-minded <laughs> to what it was gonna take for me to heal when someone would try to share with me that healing is a lifelong journey and that um, it needs you need to take a multi-pronged approach and it's going to take you a really long time, but it's worth it, I would avoid that like the plague and I would bypass that and I would believe somehow in my own magical thinking that I was going to be the exception and that I was going to heal with like bippity boppity boop, one and done, right? Wave a wand. Um, and that I was going to prove everybody wrong. And that's just not reality. Now, I'm not saying that miracles don't happen. I'm a believer in miracles. Like, I, I believe in miracles. I do. I really do. Uh, but I also believe in hard work and getting, in what we, um, getting out what we put in. And so I'm going to be continuing to put in the work that is necessary to heal fully from complex trauma because I deserve it. And I want to share this journey with you guys and show you that it's possible. Um, I've had some um, colleagues and even previous clients try to sort of pull me aside and be really nice to me and say, you know, Athena, you know, I know you really just want to show everybody it's possible, but you know, like, don't you think it, I mean, you really don't need to be, sh you know, sharing so much with, you know, on YouTube. I mean, don't you think like certain things don't need to be aired in public and you should really should keep it to yourself and you, know, you don't really need to show everyone it's possible. I mean, seriously. And basically what they were telling me is that's not something they're comfortable with. And so me doing something that they were uncomfortable with made them uncomfortable. And I'm not here to please anybody. I'm not here to please them. I'm here to help you. And I'm here to help me. <laughs> and I am grateful to be here and I have embraced the fact that this healing journey is likely going to take me the rest of my life here on this side of heaven and I'm okay with that because every single day I heal just a little bit more and I sh I'm sharing all of it with you guys there's not like I'm holding anything back so um, I'm gonna go ahead and start answering your guys's questions uh, for the next hour I will be answering your guys's questions live here there's a lot of you here tonight um, Wow Okay, so here we go. Let's see. Oh my goodness. Okay, so 
I'm going to answer last week's questions and this week's questions. So if you sent questions in this week, like um, Elizabeth and Lulu and Rach and Monica and Ashton, I want you to know that I will get to your questions for sure. And I might go out of order here in a little bit, but for right now I'm going to go back to some questions that came in last week and I want to answer some of those. So Poppy says, in general, I have an extreme willingness to sacrifice myself in negative situations. It feels like it is not an option or like I lack the motivation. Is this core belief related? It is core belief related, actually, Poppy. And really quickly, I want to show you guys the core belief screen share. As I answer Poppy's question, I want you guys to all see this. Uh, this is from last week's video. And I lost it. <laughs> of course I lost it. One second. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Where did it go? Uh -huh. um. Oh, there it is. Layers of Behavior Change by James Clear, which, by the way, um, jamesclear.com down below in the description section, and also um, Exclusive Hawaii. Those are uh, ones that I that I got um, really helpful information with for this particular screen share. So um, I'm going to show you guys the screen share, and then I'm going to read Poppy's question, and I'm going to answer it. I'm going to answer the rest of your guys' questions as well. So let me know if you guys can see this screen share and if you would be so kind as to give this video a thumbs up, I would be super duper grateful. So Poppy's question specifically is, in general I have an extreme willingness to sacrifice myself in negative situations. It feels like it is not an option, so rather you know, it's compulsive, or I lack the motivation. Is this core belief related? So the short answer, Poppy, is yes, it is core belief related. When we sacrifice ourselves on the altar of someone else's approval, it's because we were trained to do those things from a very young age. And that is what Pete Walker would call a freeze fawn trauma response type. So when we, um, so let's say if we're using this particular screen share, the layers of behavior change, the person that you believe that you are is your identity. So I'm the type of person who sacrifices myself uh, to negative things or to abusive things, and it's it's a it's a compulsion. Let me let me read the exact words. Um, I have an extreme willingness to sacrifice myself in negative situations. I, Poppy, am the type of person who tends to sacrifice myself in negative situations. So the actions you take are that when someone abusive is involved in your life or someone who's looking to take advantage of you, you allow them or you do whatever you can to make sure that they're happy or that you are satisfying their needs, their expressed and unexpressed wishes. And then what that looks like on the outside, the way that those people see you is they see, hey, you appear as though you are not going to do anything to stop me from exploiting you or taking advantage of you. So why is this core belief related when we do this? The reason, you guys, is because we don't get these behaviors and we don't practice these behaviors on accident or because someone tells us to once. It's something that we were trained to do through words and actions from a very young age, through grooming. Harriet, if you could pop up the YouTube card for the grooming video, grooming and childhood abuse video, that would be great, and link that up down in the description as well. So, for instance, when any of us are groomed during childhood to be abused, it means that our needs were met when we would do certain things or say certain things or obey certain requests. So, if we're using this particular diagram here on the screen, whenever one of your abusers would have a need to exploit you or use you as bait or um, exploit your vulnerability 
as a child, they would see that you tend to let them because you're small. Not because you let them because you wanted to, but because you were a child and you were incapable of protecting yourself. You were a small, innocent, vulnerable child. And it looked to them like you were not going to put up a fight the way an adult would. So they preyed upon you. So we move on to the actions. So the actions that they, that they noticed that they drew that conclusion from were that if they did certain things enough or they withheld love from you or they manipulated you or they met your needs and uh, fed you certain types of food or gave you certain types of attention, that you would do what they wanted you to do. And then how that unwinds up to you resulting in a core belief that you carry around with you for the rest of your life, you begin to believe all the things that they did were true and they're actually part of who you are. But that's actually a lie. See, the core beliefs that we have as adult survivors of childhood trauma, the core beliefs that we hold that are toxic are not truths, they are lies. So deductive reasoning would dictate, since I allowed myself, in, in air quotes, allowed myself to be victimized, and that these predators preyed upon me because I was little and innocent, and I was unable to fight back the way an adult would, then the core belief that matches up with that, that I end up carrying around me for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and I take it to my grave unless I restructure it, is that I am the type of person who sacrifices myself, how is it worded? I am the type of person who has an extreme willingness to sacrifice myself in negative situations. So that compulsion that you feel, that pull that you feel, like it's not an option, like you lack the motivation to rescue yourself, is part of learned helplessness, and it is something that is a result of our childhood grooming. So it's not your fault, Poppy. It's not your fault at all. And it's something that is extremely, extremely common among adult survivors of complex trauma, especially those who endured years and even decades of childhood abuse or exploitation. So the way we tackle that is through a multi-pronged approach, right? We find the opposite, the opposite of that core belief that we want to restructure, which is... In the past, I had a habit of being willing to sacrifice myself in negative situations. However, moving forward, my goal would be that I establish and maintain healthy boundaries with all toxic people and I cultivate safe relationships and I practice excellent self-care on a regular basis because I am worth it. And those are things that we have to choose to remind ourselves of on a regular basis if we're going to restructure those core beliefs. And Richard Grannon has some really, really, really great, I haven't watched his most recent, there's a few videos that he's been posting from um, seminars, and I haven't had a chance to watch them. I watched one, which was him in a hotel room, and he was saying that he's going to be recording more hotel room videos. Um, but I know that one of you guys left me a YouTube comment saying that you went to a Richard Grannon seminar and he was talking about core belief restructuring. And so I'm super excited that like, this is a thing you guys, like we need to restructure these core beliefs and it's possible. So what I was gonna say is Richard Grannon has some really great modalities and like techniques with um, neuro-linguistic programming super powerful modality. Um, there's some hypnosis and, um, and honestly, you guys, um, hypnosis, even though it sounds like woo woo and I know that a lot of people are really against it, what our abusers often used against us when we were kids is a form of hypnosis. They groomed us. They put us in a trance. They would startle us and get us to be shocked and frozen, and then they would feed us full of lies that we took around and kept with us as core beliefs about ourselves. So it only makes sense that we need to use something similar to unlock that and then 
flip it and reverse it so that we can move forward in a healthy, healthy way. So if you're willing to allow yourself to, through the power of suggestion and um, the willingness to learn different modalities, then you will have a higher likelihood of fully healing. So um, check out his channel if you guys haven't checked that out. Um, it's or just go to his website. He has tons of stuff there. It's I think it's SpartanLifeCoach.com, um, or or just search YouTube for Richard Grannon, and you'll find it. So there are tons more questions. I hope that was helpful, Poppy. Heroes don't wear capes. Says I'm always others focused. <laughs> I can't do anything that is solely for myself, big and small stuff, from renewing my driver's license to protecting myself from harm, yet I will do anything for others. Oh my goodness, yes. Okay, so heroes don't wear capes. So I believe what heroes don't wear capes is referring to is, um, I'm like just chilling on my couch, sorry guys, it's like, okay. So what, what heroes don't wear capes is referring to is I shared last week in part one of the video that I have a five-pronged approach that's really, really helped me, like, heal. And it's a, a check system that I put myself through on any at any given point of any given day. And that is I check in with my attitude. How is my attitude about my healing journey? I check into the what am I listening to? What are the voices in my head? What message about myself am I listening to? Am I being... Um, others focused and not just solely focused on myself, like reaching out and helping other people. That's the part that, that I believe Heroes Don't Wear Capes was referring to. Um, am, I, am I seeking to come from a place of humility and with a teachable spirit and I'm really looking to honor God and others and myself on this healing journey? And then uh, am I adding value? Am I choosing to add value? And so what I want to be really, really, really clear about um, Heroes Don't Wear Capes is that when I even slightly suggest that we are to be other-centered, let me tell you what I do mean and what I absolutely don't mean. First of all, what I absolutely don't ever mean by that is that we are to sacrifice ourselves on the altar of someone else's abuse or approval or anything else. Um, and in fact, the only reason I'm even able to use, as a, uh, use that as a part of a check system for my own mind and my own healing journey is because I've gotten to the place where I have established and maintained extremely healthy boundaries with toxic people. I've cultivated safe relationships and I no longer allow myself to be sacrificed on the altar of other people's approval. And so I would say for you to take that out of the equation, um, being extremely others focused to the point where we're not even allowed to, like we don't even allow ourselves the luxury of taking care of ourselves, rescuing ourselves from harm, or doing things for ourselves like, um, you know, getting our driver's license renewed or shaving our legs or, or taking care of ourselves like being able to bathe and wash ourselves or washing our car, balancing our checkbook, uh, making sure that we show up our best self at work and um, cultivating safe relationships. Like if we're not to the point where we're able to do those things because we are still so, 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 so stuck, then remove that completely from your list of things to do. You need to be the priority. You absolutely need to be the priority. This goes against a lot of popular messages that are out there, which is like, you're so selfish. And I know if I ask for a raise of hands, for a show of hands right now, for how many people were told by their narcissistic parents, their abusive parents, their exploitative parents, their overtly, horrifically violating parents that, are, that were selfish and that didn't even have any business having children, if I were to ask you all to raise your hands right now for how many of you heard the phrase, you are so selfish. I can't believe you're just thinking of yourself. All you think about is yourself. You're so selfish. You should just be grateful. When I was your age, I didn't have this, 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 or this. You have everything. You should just be grateful. And I know that if I asked for a show of hands, that almost all of you who are adult survivors of childhood trauma, many of you, if not all of you, would raise your hands. Because the way abusers, specifically caregivers slash parents, justify their abuse to themselves, 
which is weird that they even need that, but they do, they justify their abusive behavior towards us by saying, well, I'm not as bad towards them as my parents were towards me. They're never, they've never gone through what I went through. So it doesn't matter how bad their lives are. It'll never be as bad as mine. So I'm good. I'm golden. I can just treat them as shitty as I want to treat them because they're never going to live in the Great Depression or they're never going to know what it's like to be homeless or I make sure there's food in the refrigerator so they're never going to go hungry. So they use that as like a free pass at life so that they can just be jerks and be abusive and neglectful and unkind and uncompassionate and not accepting and not nurturing and not parental. And what that does is that causes us to all need YouTube channels like this to let you know that it's not your fault, that you were programmed. You were programmed. You have malware installed in your hard drive from a long time ago, and it's just on repeat. It just has a repeat, and it's on run. And it just, that malware that's installed on your hard drive is just running at all times. It's just running. And whenever you're gonna embark on something new, it runs again. And whenever you're gonna start a new relationship, it runs again. And whenever you're going to like reach your goal weight because you've been exercising, it runs again. And just that, that old message, you know, the old message that was taught to you from a very young age, you're going to go out for it. You're going to apply for a new job that you've really been excited about. You're going to uh, travel out of town on an airplane for the very first time. There's that old message again. The malware runs again. You're going to possibly uh, break the cycle of intergenerational family dysfunction and you're going to want to not pass on the cycle of the abuse that you've gone through. Whoops, there goes that message again. It's just on repeat. So you guys, please, please, please know that one of those things that I do to check in with myself, which is, am I being other centered? What that means for me in my own Athena speak is, am I sitting in a pile of my own self pity? And if I am, how can I turn some of that pain into a purpose and reach out and try to help somebody else that's struggling also. But it's all the while I am helping myself. I'm not sacrificing myself and caring for someone else instead of myself. I'm actually caring for myself and while I'm going to do what's best for myself, I want to reach out and I want to help somebody else because that is always a positive thing for anyone who's been through abuse. If they can help just one other person, and then they really realize how far they've come in their healing journey. So I hope that's helpful. Heroes don't wear capes. That's what I meant by that. And I hope that um, hope that's clear. I never want you to to suffer and to only help other people and not yourself. So let me just get a drink of water, you guys. Hold on one sec. Okay, so we have a ton more questions, a ton of questions. Here we go. By the way, I listened back to myself from last week's video because I wanted to make sure I didn't cover all the same topics and I wanted to see what question I landed on and ended on or whatever. My voice sounds super duper duper annoying over video. So now I know why I get all those messages like from people that say I'm annoying. Um, don't ever listen to yourself on video. I don't recommend it. Okay, so Joey says, this is a question, this is a question sent in last week and we have a ton from tonight as well. Joey says, growing up I was always told that I was unlovable and that I was not worthy of anything, and that I would never be accepted. Now that I am in support groups, and everyone tells me that they love me, and that I will always be accepted, and that I am worth it, how can I change these negative comments and start believing the truth? I just feel stuck, and I don't think I can move forward until I start believing, but it is just so hard. What can I do? Oh, well, that's an amazing statement to make, Joey. Um, and the reason I say that that's an amazing statement to make is because it wasn't too long ago, Joey, that you would not even be able to type that message out. I don't think you ever would have even been able to accept the fact that we say kind things to you and that we don't want anything in return. Like the very fact that you're able to say, I'm in support groups now and I'm told that I'm lovable and that I'm cared about and that I'm accepted. Like 
that's huge that you're able to even articulate that. I just want to acknowledge that you've come quite a long way from where you were, Joey. You've been with us for a little while now. And my answer to you is please just give it some time. You are light years farther in your healing journey today than you were when you first arrived with us. And I want to encourage you to keep on going because it's just going to take some time, honestly. And that's, that's part A of my answer to you. And part B is a little bit more advanced. And that is you're going to need to either get to the library or get some books on Amazon and continue reading up on healthy boundaries and safe people. Um, there's a book called Boundaries. There's a book called Safe People. You know I always recommend those two. There's another one called Love is a Choice by Minerth and Meyer. Um, there is another one, uh, Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Amazing book. There's another book called Psychopath Free. It's a book that I'm um, kind of starting to read. And you guys, uh, we, we need to educate ourselves on what it is that we've been through and how it is that we can heal. So, Joey, I would, as part three to my answer, I would look back at that screen share that I shared at the beginning of this broadcast, not the one from last week, but the one prior to that, the, the one with the white background, which I'll probably tweet out later. I would, I would use that as sort of a checklist. You know, I would, I would learn as many of those things as I could. I would surround myself with people that care about me and that believe in me. Because honestly, the more you're around people that reflect back to you what it is that they see, and they reflect back to you the truth of what it is that you are reflecting out to them, it rewrites those old tapes. It rewrites the malware that was planted on your hard drive, and you'll start to believe those good things about yourself. Like how does Bobby, how do Bobby always put it? You, you build up your good pile instead of trying to delete your bad pile. Because sooner or later, your good pile is going to, be like to the roof whereas your bad pile is like just a little pile of dust on the ground you know you just keep looking at more good things that you're doing more good relationships that you're cultivating things that you're doing that are good for you kind things that you're saying things you're doing that are helpful for your healing journey healthy choices that you're making safe relationships that you're cultivating healthy boundaries that you're maintaining and that's gonna help you so um, I hope that helps Joey, but you're doing so good. Like, I just hope you know that you're doing good. Next question. Role play host says, why do I crave unhealthy relationships? I'm already in one that I'm happy in is, is healthy and it helps me and has lasted five years. Wait. So role play host craves unhealthy relationships, but they are in a happy relationship that is healthy and that helps them and has lasted five years. So, hmm, I will answer this question the best, best way I know how, and that is to say that the reason that we crave unhealthy relationships is because something along the way from the time we were little until now has been unhealthy. It could be anything. It could be a traumatic incident. It could be a relationship. It could be a way that we were treated. It could be some sort of experience. And so we convinced ourselves when that unhealthy experience happened that this is normal. And, and the way we do this, please don't miss this, you guys. The way we convince ourselves that the situation that we went through that is unhealthy is normal is us as children, the people that are taking care of us, they are the world. And so if we're around adults, like we're small, they're big, whoever these adults are that are around us, we're convinced that they are the world, okay? So if something happens and it's scary, Rather than believe that the whole world is scary, which means we would die, we figure out a way to make ourselves the problem. Well, I must have done something to cause that, so I won't do it again. Because then we have some control over the situation. So we blame ourselves so that it helps us to 
be able to control the situation. And then we just try to do something different and do something different and do something different again and again and again and again. But what happens is we end up always going back to what is familiar. So role play host, I would say that at some point in your life, you experienced something that was traumatic. And instead of believing what a child would believe, which is that is scary, which means the whole world is scary. And if the whole world is scary, I'm going to die. What you did in your child's mind is you convinced yourself that you caused it so that you could survive it. And then you moved on. But you're, I mean, obviously you're young, so you don't really have a direction in which you can form solid opinions about yourself. So you navigate your way through life and you simply fall into little grooves of what is familiar. So if something was traumatic in your life or unhealthy, in air quotes, then you're going to gravitate towards that because it's familiar. Now remember, it's not them that's scary. You were the one that made it scary because you resolved that you were the cause of it so that you could have control over it. So you don't even have a gauge that says that one thing was bad, that one thing was scary because you turned it inward and said, I must have done something to make that scary. So I'll just move on now and I won't do whatever that thing was again. And then you fall into a similar situation. It's just the way we are as humans. It's the way our child's mind makes sense of an unfigureoutable world when we're little. Because if we're little and the rest of the world is big and something scary happens in the rest of the world, we cannot, as children, say the rest of the world is totally scary and crazy. It just is. Because deductive reasoning would dictate, as a very young child, our subconscious would cause us to believe that we are just going to die. And we wouldn't be able to survive. We, we can't survive that level of adrenaline and cortisol and all the other chemicals that are flowing through our body. So we somehow just make a very simple decision in one particular moment. Well, I must have caused that. I won't cause it anymore. Okay, move on. Like it's just the way we resolve things. It's the way we create order as children. So I hope that helps role play host. Um, and I hope it helps to know that you're not alone, that we all do it. <laughs> so. Um, let me see here. I have like, oh, okay. I have my, my fan going and it's like blowing my hair everywhere. Let's see. Sabra, Sabra says, one of my beliefs is that I am a monster. I am unworthy of good or forgiveness. It is affecting me applying to grad school. I know logically it isn't true, but my emotions get the best of me. Any ideas? I do have ideas. I do, I do, I do. So Sabra, I could pull up the screen share and we'll, we can reverse engineer it together. I hope that will help you. I'm gonna do it briefly for everyone. Thank you for asking such a brave question, Sabra. Um, you guys are all very brave, by the way. You guys are all asking such great questions. So here we go. So we are Sabra, okay? And this is what we are going to do. We we are Sabra. So what the world sees is that Sabra looks as though, how did she word it? Sabra looks as though she doesn't deserve to be forgiven for anything. And the reason that people are going to think this is that because the actions that Sabra takes are she exudes characteristics that cause people to believe that she comes across as though she believes the worst about herself, like she's a monster, she's unworthy of good or forgiveness. And so that causes her core belief to say, I'm the type of person who is a monster and who is unworthy of anything good and unworthy of forgiveness. So the way that we can work through this, Sabra, is we what we need to do is we need to challenge that core belief. So we need to find evidence. And I feel like I want to look at you right now. You guys can see the screen share. Screenshot this if you need to. I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of it now. Sabra, I just want to look at you. Okay. So I want you to know, Sabra, 
that you did not arrive in this on this planet already believing that you were a monster and that you weren't worthy of anything good and you weren't worthy of forgiveness. That was something that was taught to you from people who were abusive, unkind, um, sadistic perhaps, narcissistic, neglectful, unhealthy, okay? They taught you those beliefs about yourself so that you would exude characteristics that caused you to cultivate relationships that were similar to those. They taught you those beliefs about yourself by shredding your self-confidence and shredding your self-esteem. I'm not Sabra. I didn't grow up in Sabra's home. I'm just going to throw out there some things that are very, very, very common. So if Sabra was a little girl growing up and all she wanted was her mom's approval and kindness or just some soft, kind words or to spend time with her mother or she wanted her mother to, um, she drew a picture for her mother and she wanted her mother to put the picture up on the refrigerator or she did a project at school and so she wanted her mom and dad to come to open house and come to parent teacher night and or maybe maybe Sabra was in band or in choir or she played a sport in school and all she wanted was her mom and dad to come see her play in these sports or or these uh, extracurricular activities and they year after year after year perhaps they didn't attend this is just one example. This could not be ringing any bells for you. But over and over and over and over again, whatever it was, whether it was coloring the picture, whether it was just wanting to have a meal with her parents, or whether it was her aunt and uncle, uh, she just wanted to maybe play games with them or go to the park or, or maybe she wanted to hang out with some cousins or maybe she just wanted to uh, be accepted or she wanted to say funny jokes during during family time and she wanted to make people laugh but like she didn't Sabre didn't necessarily get the response she was looking for her needs were not met she had basic needs to be loved accepted cared for unconditionally fed clothed um, just she needed to feel safe so if over a long period of time through words and actions and withholding of love, we are given messages that we are not safe, we are not worthy of clothing, we are not worthy of good healthy food, we are not worthy of spending time with, we are not worthy of laughing at jokes, attending school events, hanging the picture up on the refrigerator, going to the, to the swim meet or to the baseball game or to the concert or to the performance or to the competition, then over and over and over and over and over and over again, little Sabra believes, I'm not worth it. If I would have done something better, they would have attended. If I would just have done blank, then they would have done this. If I would just have been born different, that's the core belief then my life wouldn't be what it is now. So we take someone else's lack of love. We, the survivor, take someone else's inability to see our worth. We, the survivors, take someone else's failure to parent us, to feed us healthy food, to give us clothes that fit, to provide safe shelter where we will not be victimized or exploited. We, the survivors, take other people's shortcomings and so that we don't have to believe that the world is a big bad place that we're gonna die in, we turn it inward and we believe, well, I just need to do better. I just need to do more. I just need to be prettier. I just need to be skinnier. I just need to be nicer. I just need to do more. I just need to think more, to get better grades, to be more. I just need to fill in the blank, sacrifice myself on the altar of everyone else's approval and needs so that it will prove that I am worthy of anything good. The only reason that we were forced to believe those horrible things about ourselves is because the world was so, 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 so scary that little, 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 little us would never have been able to survive unless little, little, little us said, okay, the world's not scary, it's just because I did blank. And so what I'll do 
is I'll do something different. And then we find ourselves running on a treadmill of different works and different choices and different things and different ideas until we finally find something that sticks. We're desperate for someone to just show us a little bit of good attention instead of bad attention. And that is how we end up in toxic relationships. Because oftentimes, toxic individuals are searching for people who are sort of looking around wondering, am I okay? Am I acceptable? Am I approvable? Am I going to be okay? Am I pretty enough? Am I good enough? Am I skinny enough? Am I smart enough? Am I nice enough? Do I do enough? I'll do more. I'll just do more. I'll just be more. And so that core belief that we are not worthy of good things or that we are monster and gross and disgusting, what that is a result of is us hustling for our worth all the way from birth. And then we use our adult mind to judge that younger version of us that jumped through hoops trying to fit into everyone else's world, sometimes doing things that we're not very proud of. I've done a lot of things that I'm not very proud of. I've shared some things with you guys. Hey Harriet, could you pop up the YouTube card for the for the video on re-victimization or re-traumatization? I think I just recorded it like a month, month and a half ago. Re-traumatization. Here are some videos on the video traumatization I found on the web. Have a look. <laughs> Siri, Siri thinks I'm talking to her. I'm not talking to you, Siri. I'm talking to Harriet. Um so, so I've done a lot of things that I'm not very proud of. And so what, cause, what causes me, adult now me, unless I restructure my core beliefs, to believe that I'm not worthy of anything good and that I'm gross and I'm disgusting, is I look at all of the things I did to earn people's approval, earn their love, earn their time, earn their favor. How did I get that job? How did I get that promotion? How did I stay in that person's good graces? How did I feed my kid? How did I get diaper money? How did I blah, blah, fill in the blank? And I look at all these things that I did, the choices I made as an adult, and then I judge them when all I was doing was what I was trained to do from birth. I was trained from birth that I wasn't enough. And no matter what I did and no matter what I said and no matter what I thought, no matter what I looked like, I would never be pretty enough, smart enough, skinny enough, nice enough, or fill in the blank, enough. And so I just kept hustling for my worth and hustling for my worth, sacrificing all of myself, including my dignity, on the altar of everyone else's approval. And I no longer am doing that anymore. And I no longer believe the core belief that I am a monster and I am gross and I'm disgusting and I'm not worthy of any good things. But it didn't just happen overnight. <laughs> so, Sabra, I will sit with you. I will stand with you. I will fight with you <laughs> until you believe the truth, which is you might not be proud of every single version of yourself that you were yesterday and last year and last year and 10 years ago and 20 years ago. But you damn well better be somehow, some way proud of who you are today because you are alive. And I have never met an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse or complex trauma that has not struggled with the desire to be alive. <laughs> Every single one of us has struggled with, why am I even here? This is too hard. This is too exhausting. I can't do this. But I'm telling you, that restructuring our core beliefs is possible, behavior change is possible, feeling joy and feeling good things is possible, and seeing ourselves in a different light is possible. I would not have been able to say that with a straight face if you would have asked me a few years ago, but I'm saying it now. <laughs> so, And I might not feel this great in a few days, but today I feel fantastic because I've been doing the work. So. I hope that's helpful, Sabra. You deserve so many good things. And let me just tell you that you're not a monster and you're not gross and you're not disgusting and you are worthy 
of all good things. And I will help you as much as I can just every week here, every Monday, or even in our groups because you're really active in our groups. So, and by the way, if you guys are all, if any of you are struggling with core beliefs and um, behaviors, uh, behavioral change uh, and just wanting to be on a different path and you're not in a group of other people that are on the same path I highly recommend you find somebody that you like um, Angie Atkinson has some great groups um, I think Richard Grannon has a forum where like-minded people all go um, there's out of the out of the fog there's out of the storm um, there's another one I think it's called seven teacups or something teacups um, there's all kinds of different online groups where survivors of trauma come together and they support one another and they encourage one another to be their best selves. And I run a whole bunch of them myself. So <laughs> please do something to get yourself into a group, especially if you don't think that you're worthy of being in a group, because that's the first step of knowing that you need to be in a group. If you believe that you're so repulsive and disgusting and unhelpable that you don't deserve to be in a group of other people that are struggling also, that is the first indicator that you need to be in a group <laughs> once you get the courage to do it. Don't do it because I tell you to do it, because that would be you doing trying to be more and do more. You're fine. But if you ever just want to be in a group of other like-minded individuals, then please don't hesitate to reach out because you deserve it. Um, let's see here. Next question. Julie says, core belief. I am a bad person and I am undeserving of love. Proof. I am not close with anyone other than my husband. I screw up and drive people away. Okay. So, Julie, the only way to restructure that core belief is to be in a group of other people that are going through the same thing that you're going through and share with them, I believe that I am unlovable and I'm not close with any other people. <laughs> and then other people that have felt the same way will likely chime in and say, I've felt that exact same way before. But I think you're rather lovely, and I think you're kind, and I think you're funny, and I like you. And I mean, I'm here, and I've corresponded with you in some of our groups, and I've um, talked with you actually on a previous project that we worked on. And you know, um, I think you're great. We're all a work in progress. We need to have some grace and some patience with ourselves. So that might not help, but I really hope that it does somehow because you deserve kindness and joy and love. Do you guys hear that little bird outside that sounds like a dog that's going bow, bow. He'll do it again in just a second. He's my favorite little bird. He comes by to visit me. It's, four, it's after four o'clock. He comes around like every single day to say hi to me and he comes in the mornings. Anyway, sorry, random, random, random. Stay on task, Athena, goodness. Okay, so Monica says, how can you tell the difference of not trusting someone because they are narcissists to knowing if we are projecting our untrustworthy family onto them? So Monica, this is an excellent question. So if any of you guys are not familiar with the traits of a narcissist, um, I highly suggest you Google it, look up different traits of narciss narcissists or people who are predatory, and then also look up the term projecting so that you know what Monica's talking about. So Monica, the only thing that helps me in this particular situation is time. So time and asking someone that I trust and giving them the facts and asking for them to reflect back and ask questions. So, perfect, excuse me, perfect example. Um, goodness, could my hair be any frizzier today, you guys? I mean, hello. So this is a perfect example, Monica. I was dating my husband when we were just dating. This is like eight years ago, seven years ago. So we were dating, and um, he was a great guy, super great guy, like really calm and just fun and not abusive, not weird, not controlling. He was responsible, really active in the community, has 
a whole bunch of friends. Like he's not loner guy because I always ended up somehow with loner guy and like that's a red flag because it can be a red flag because if somebody doesn't have anybody that knows them or that is around them, you know, they need to work on themselves. Like they're not like rule them out forever, but they need to cultivate other safe relationships. That's part of being safe. Part of being a safe person is cultivating safe relationships <laughs> and being a safe person. You know, you got to learn how to be a safe person and cultivate safe relationships. And the way we do that is by establishing and maintaining healthy boundaries. So I was dating my husband. He has all these different really close friends that have known him for 20, 30, 40 years. People that I know um, that are like mutual friends. And he's like not any like anybody I've ever dated before. But yet there's one thing that happens, right? One thing that felt really familiar and I freaked out and I bailed. I like, fr I froze and then I like went downstairs and I had my purse and everything and I left. <laughs> I left like in the middle of like a date we were going to make dinner. <laughs> and um, it's just, it's just part of my junk. It's part of my junk. I freaked out. Um, I was projecting. Um, it was, I was Honestly, I was looking for an excuse to bail because Monica, to be quite honest, me allowing myself to be vulnerable and to let somebody else in and allow myself to care for another person, which was potentially setting myself up for pain, that was terrifying for me. And so I sabotaged every single relationship I possibly could. I would look for reasons to sabotage my relationships so that I wouldn't have to get close to anybody. And until I allowed myself the grace and the patience and the time to stop sabotaging every relationship before I could get to know them and before they could get to know me, I would just cut them off completely for one reason or another, always under the umbrella of, well, they would probably never like me anyway. It would, it would probably end badly. I believed that I was bad and that I wasn't worthy of love is what it was. So, in order to prove my hypothesis wrong, I needed to allow myself to be vulnerable and allow him to see me and all of me, like all of the ugliness, all of the parts I didn't want him to know about. I needed to allow him to see my flaws, to know what my fears were, where I had been from, what I had been through, and that was terrifying to me. But in doing that, I... <laughs> I found out that I am lovable <laughs> and that I'm not annoying and horrible and disgusting and gross, you know, but it's terrifying. It's super terrifying and it doesn't come overnight. So the only thing that's going to help in this particular instance, Monica, is time and by allowing somebody else that you trust to know all the details and sort of reflect back to you. Well, you might be being a little bit touchy here and maybe you should let him get to know you. And well, that was, a, that was a red flag. Has he done that before? And what are some other things that he's done that are red flags, you know? Um, and just allow somebody that's impartial, like an impartial third person, someone who's not emotionally vested into this relationship that can reflect back to you what it is that they see, perhaps in a safe group or someone that you consider to be a safe person. So I know that all sounds very terrifying. It would to me, like at the beginning of my healing journey and even in the middle and even probably like a couple years ago. But, um, but it helps and it works. So Dawn says, so the fact that I am feeling abandonment can bring up other new memories and trigger a whole bunch of issues, which could be the whole basis of this new nightmare, which is challenging my core beliefs and I have new stuff. Yes, abandonment is definitely a trigger. Um, for anyone here on this channel that has incurred any type of attachment trauma, like your trauma happened from a very, very, very young age, perhaps you had a, um, uh, a caregiver, a parent from a very young age that was not fully present, they were emotionally unavailable or physically unavailable, which caused you to either be reactive towards attachment or very disorganized in your attachment style. Um, and if attaching to anyone causes you great like stress, 
um, and you have deep abandonment issues, like anytime things change, it's almost like it triggers abandonment in you, any change whatsoever, and it's like abandonment trigger. Um, I had a client that went into a full-blown spin-out um, because one of her shows that she had been watching on TV for a lot of years was going off the air. And she felt completely abandoned, and it triggered all these other feelings of abandonment all the way back to childhood. So it was an opportunity and a gift for us to work through all of the other traumas. But that show going off the air triggered such deep abandonment in her that she, she knew that it couldn't just be the show. Like, this is affecting me so deeply, and I'm so angry about this and so frustrated about this. This has to be something older. Because remember, you guys, what I have been talking about for years on this channel, if you range your reaction to something on a scale of one to 10 and it's between a one and a five and you're like, huh, I'm kind of irritated about that or wow, that kind of affects me and it's between a one and a five, then chances are that's relational and that's a natural response and you're like, ah, I'm really irked. But if you're between a six and a 10 and you're spinning out over something that you have no control over, like a show going off the air or someone changing their work schedule or someone moving out of town that has lived in your neighborhood for a while or you know um your favorite uh person on facebook no longer has a facebook account or if your favorite youtuber is like making different types of videos now like these are real things they disrupt our schedule and if other people's life choices cause you to be triggered between a six and a 10, like not just normal one to five, like oh, I'm kind of irked, like that's kind of, that sucks. But like you're like angry and you're spinning out and it's triggering all kinds of feelings of unsafety for you, then that's old stuff, that's unprocessed trauma, okay? And if we don't process our trauma, it shows up in other places that don't make sense. And so what that show going off the air did was it gave us an opportunity and a gift in the moment to go, what does this feel like and what does this remind me of and why? And we were able to work through a lot of things. So I know it sucks when it happens in the moment and I know that it's really hard when abandonment triggers other feelings and even feelings of abandonment are so, 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 so painful and they do they do challenge our core beliefs. Abandonment in and of itself causes us to believe in the deepest part of our core that we weren't worth being there for, we weren't worth loving, we weren't worth paying attention to, and that just takes time. It really takes time, and again, talk therapy plus some sort of physical modality or some sort of somatic healing, um, even if it's an ex expressive therapy as well, that's going to, really warrant and yield a lot more results for you than it would if you just did talk therapy and talked about your trauma. Because trauma is felt and the right hemisphere of our brain is where we feel things and the language center of our brain is in the left hemisphere. And remember, your amygdala gets hijacked. The bridge is out. So when we feel things and it's traumatic and we're like, Ugh, nah, and you just don't even have words for it, it's because we feel things, we feel trauma in the right hemisphere and we speak things, we use words in the left hemisphere. And if it's triggering like a root trauma, which could be abandonment or attachment trauma, we're not gonna find words for it. We're only gonna be able to express those things through physical modalities, perhaps trauma-sensitive yoga that causes us to cry and release, or even um, painting or other types of expressive modalities. So that's my, my greatest recommendation for anything that is even close to abandonment or attachment trauma. I hope that was helpful. Willow says, if I liked a reaction of someone or I looked at them and their body language or behavior was authentic, I would make mental notes and use the behaviors myself. Weird, right? Anyone else? So, okay, I've done this, Willow. <laughs> <laughs> I've done this, Willow, and it's not weird. I want, to, I want to really reflect back to you that this isn't weird. It's just modeling. It's actually healthy role modeling. So if there's a little girl, and she's with her big sister and her mom, and her big sister and her mom decide that when a car is going to drive by, they step back and they don't cross the street, 
the little girl knows, oh, I need to step back and not cross the street. <laughs> or if this big person that we don't know walks up to us and my big sister and my mom don't talk to him right away and they their body language is different, then I will model their body language and I will not walk up to this strange person and say, hi, what's your name? My name's Willow. And so that's relating to childhood, but even in adulthood. So I have a colleague that talks very different than I do. <laughs> and I use different types of words to describe my feelings and describe my, my business and my protocols and my needs and my wants and my ideas and my dreams and my vision. And this colleague of mine uses very, very, very different words than I do. But they've reflected back to me recently that the words I use have been a healthy model for them. Like, I talk different now. I see how you respond to this, this, and this, and it has really helped me, Athena. And I'm like, wow, thanks. And then I realized, hey, there's this thing that you do, like a few things that you do, that I normally wouldn't do, but it really helps me too. And so, Willow, I want you to know that that's just healthy, and we sometimes grew up in an environment where we didn't have healthy role models. We didn't have adults who were healthy contributors to society, who were loving and kind and accepting and spent time with their children and made sure that they had healthy food, safe shelter, good clothing, strong shoes that didn't wear out, um, parents who helped do the homework, parents who volunteered with the PTA or were the team mom or the team dad or the Cub Scout dad or, you know, sometimes a lot of people on this channel, uh, um, in all actuality, we didn't have those types of uh, role models growing up. And so we find ourselves looking to other people and almost longing for that teaching, for that modeling that we never ever had. And I just want to give you permission to feel those feelings because A, you were robbed if you didn't have those things as a kid, and B, it's almost miraculous and beautiful that it's being provided for you now. The other person that's modeling it for you doesn't need to know that they're the biggest deal that's ever happened to you, but you can graciously receive the modeling that they're, that they're doing for you here in your adult life and go, wow, that touches me deeply on like a really deep, maybe even younger version of me level. Like I might have needed to know that, you know? Um, something that I can relate this to, Willow, is like when I volunteer in the preschool or in um, Sunday school at church and I see little kids and they're filled with joy and they share and or they throw a tantrum or they act a certain way and then I watch how the other adults relate to them and I watch how the other kids relate to them because I was never around other little children ever 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 and so I, I almost allow myself to sort of like take that in and like by osmosis, know what that acceptance and that kindness and that normalcy feels like. And I could easily judge myself and say, weird, right? <laughs> or I can go, wow, what a gift that here I am, an adult. I'm a trustworthy adult. I'm a trauma-informed, healthy, trustworthy adult. And I get to be around these little babies, these little, these little children who are filled with joy and they have this life and they get to play and run and the sprinklers and, and, and act this way and raise their voice and play with toys and talk to one another and draw pictures and do things with popsicle sticks and learn Bible verses and sing songs. And I'm just like, I want to do it. <laughs> you know, um, and again, I could easily judge myself and not share this with you on a live broadcast for the whole world to see like how weird I am, but you know what? I was robbed of those things. Robbed, straight up robbed of those things. <laughs> and I did not have them. And I consider the fact that I'm 43 years old and I'm experiencing those things for the first time to be a gift. <laughs> And that's what I'm going to say. And that's what I'm just going to receive it as. So I could easily judge myself and you and anybody else. Or I could go, wow, what a gift. And I want to encourage you to receive it as a gift because I see it as a gift for you, Willow. I think it's amazing. So Tara or Tara, I never know how to pronounce your name. I'm so sorry. Tara or Tara says, a core belief I have struggled with 
is that I am fundamentally different and unworthy. I first felt this around age six. It evolved over time to I am evil or I am only worth sex. It really kicks my butt so hard to change despite evidence negating it. <laughs> yeah, it is so hard to change despite evidence negating it. It is. Um, I have... I have similar, I have similar core beliefs. So, okay, so she says, I am fundamentally different. I've totally struggled with that. I still do sometimes. I am unworthy. I still struggle with that sometimes, not as often as I used to. She first felt this around age six. I would say I remember maybe even a little bit younger than this maybe even like four, but six sounds pretty, pretty, uh, pretty solid. And I felt it again really strongly around seven. Um, this core belief that, that uh, Tara holds, it evolved over time to that she was evil, which I absolutely identify with. I even shared with, with Sonia, my therapist that I'm doing EMDR with, as, as early as, as like six or eight weeks ago, I remember telling her that I really believed that there was a part of me that was inherently evil. Like I had something evil in me, like seriously. And then she asked me, ooh, Tara, I want to look at you. So my therapist asked me, what would it take for you to have that evil no longer be in you, Athena? How could we? How could we make sure that you were no that you were no longer evil and that you didn't have that personality trait that you believe that you have? And I sat there, Tara, and trigger warning, you guys. I sat there with her question that she asked me, and I was like, I was like, okay, what would it take for me to not feel as though I were evil? And it was just this thing that sort of ran up and like sort of hijacked everything about me like right before I went to my EMDR session that day. I couldn't figure it out. I didn't know where it came from. And I sat there, Tara, and I wept and just wept and wept and wept. And I finally answered her and I said, I would have needed to be born into a different family. And I honestly believed in that moment that I was born evil, like because of who I came from, because they allowed me to be abused and exploited. Um, that that DNA flows through my veins, it's in my body, and so I must embody that evil. And I just wept and I wept and I wept for that version of me and then I sat with it for a while and then when I was doing my reprocessing and my therapist had reflected back to me what I was feeling and what I was saying and it was so empowering for her to share with me that it would be so it's almost impossible for me to explain to you like what it is that she said that turned light bulbs on for me because I can't think of the exact words she used but it ended up being that the narrative I created for my life, <laughs> didn't plan on losing it tonight, guys. Sorry, trigger warning. <laughs> um, I'll sit here and bear witness to your pain and your truth. Thanks for bearing witness to my pain and my truth as I sit here and bawl my eyes out on, on camera. But um, the narrative that I had created for my life in that moment was I would basically never not be evil because I could never be born from a different mother and father. I could never be born into a different family. And so I had created this self-fulfilling prophecy of failure and evil. And then I realized how defeatist that was and how I was handing all of my power and everything good over to these people that shouldn't even have been having children <laughs> and just giving it all to them and saying, 
here you go. Like you get to dictate who I am forever and ever. And then somehow through the process of EMDR, which I highly recommend, um, I was able to reprocess that feeling of I am evil to I may have come from people who embody evil, but they don't get to dictate what I become and who I serve and who I help and what I do in this world and the light that I bring and the love that I share. So I want to encourage you to allow yourself to weep and grieve if you need to, but please, 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 whatever you do, find someone to reflect back to you the goodness that you bring to this world. Because I know, I know that I know that I know, that if you're here on this channel and you're watching these videos and you've made it an hour and a half into a video, you want to get better and you've been traumatized and it's not what's wrong with you is never the question if you're here on this channel. It's what happened to you. What did someone do to you? What happened to you? Not, it's not ever what's wrong with you. So I know I'm out of time and I didn't get to everybody's questions. I feel like, I feel like I suck. I'm so sorry. Um, two more questions. Two more questions really quick. I'm going to answer them super fast. Gary says, my light bulb for Athena is that I believe I can't keep this up. You know, Gary, I know what kind of deep, deep, deep work you're doing and how hard you're working. And I just want to reflect back to you what I see you doing, which is miraculous, amazing, hard work. Like you work so hard for yourself and you are challenging your core beliefs on a daily basis. And the more you press back, and you press through those barriers that you keep coming up against, you're going to see beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can keep this up and that you're going to, you're going to be pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. All of a sudden you're going to go, whoa, and then it's not going to be as much work anymore. You're going to push through that crazy barrier and you're going to like be all the way on the other side of your, of your pain and your trauma. And will it be easy forever and ever? No, but you'll have a reprieve and you'll feel a lightness about you that you haven't felt in a while. I believe that, Gary. With every ounce of my being, I believe that. I see how hard you're working and I know what that feels like. Do you just sit there defeated and you feel crushed and you're like, I just can't keep this up. I just can't. There's no way. I won't survive. But I just want to just, please, I just implore you, don't give up, Gary, because you're doing good work. You're doing excellent work. You're working so hard and you're like this close to a breakthrough and you'll be able to breathe and sort of reset and then choose to move forward in whatever direction you move forward. You experienced it before and here you are in another wave of healing and I just, I believe in you. So please don't give up, Gary. Sharon says, I am not sure what my core beliefs are. I am so messed up. I am completely fuzzy. Well, that is a core belief, Sharon. Thinking that I am so messed up, that's a core belief. So I want to encourage you to sit with that. Find out how old you were when you came to that belief to begin with. Sit with that younger version of you if possible. And then find ways to poke holes in your theory and disprove your hypothesis by pointing to all the things that show how not messed up you are. Like how you picked up and, and moved just recently to pursue something that you'd always wanted. All the times that you've gone diving and, and the things that you love and how kind you are to animals and how much love you have for others. And you have been very, very good at establishing and maintaining healthy boundaries with toxic people in your lives. And you're active in safe community and you support other people on a regular basis. And these are just the things I know of. And I live thousands of miles from you across an ocean. So I, you encourage me and I'm just one person. So anyway, I just want to encourage you, Sharon, to poke holes in your theory and try to disprove your hypothesis that you're just messed up because you're not just messed up. So I know that I didn't get to everybody's questions, you guys. Um, I think this means we're doing part three of this topic because it is a popular topic. 
Um, really quickly, I want to say thank you to Ashton and Monica and Lulu and Elizabeth. And oh, I I want to be able to answer your guys' questions, but I think I might need to do a part three. Um, and I hope that's okay. Are you guys losing patience with me? Do you hear the words in my head? Do you hear? Do you hear my my core beliefs that I'm that I'm failed and that I didn't do enough and that I didn't I didn't answer the questions quick enough and that it's annoying for you? Like I I'm just gonna challenge that core belief and I'm gonna say it's not true. So um, yeah. <laughs> um, gosh, there are still a lot of you here. I just want to thank you. You guys are amazing. You guys are the reason this community is so um, so awesome. I'm privileged and honored and humbled to be here serving you guys every single week. Um, this community continues to grow week after week. You guys, we are reaching people in over 180 countries that think they're all alone. So thanks for showing up. Thanks for supporting one another. I can't tell you how much it means to me that you guys show up every week to support one another. Um, thank you. And I'll be back here again, again, same time, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on October 9th, Monday. And it'll be on core belief restructuring and um, behavior change and how we can challenge those core beliefs that we have about ourselves, you guys. So tag somebody that you think needs to hear this message. Maybe share last week's video and tonight's video with them. Um, and if you have other topics, besides this one that you would prefer, then put them down in the comments once this video is, is not live anymore. And you can say something like, you know, the last couple weeks have been great, but how about we move on to another topic? <laughs> but be nice, please. <laughs> Don't be mean. <laughs> mean people suck. Okay. Well, I love you guys, and I really appreciate you. Thanks so much. I'll see you next week. Bye.